in Jesus. And so he says, abide in me and I in you. See, when you became a Christian, it's not just about you uh, entering the kingdom. The kingdom now has to enter into you. And that grafting process is the beautiful process of me and Jesus becoming closer and closer and closer until we become one. Um, so I want to start today's message by putting focus back on our Abba Father. Uh, of recognizing that he is a good father, first of all, and recognizing that he is our father. One of the biggest revelations that Jesus came to give to humanity wasn't so much just the kingdom, and it wasn't so much just about believing in God. Because the Old Testament prophets all revealed that. They revealed about the kingdom. They revealed about the promised land. They revealed blessings. They revealed so many things. But it was Jesus who came to bring the biggest revelation. He said... He is our father. Notice his revelation was not to go around to the disciples and saying, he is my father. He says, no, no, he's not just my father. He is your father as well. And if you see my father respond to me, how much more will he respond to you? And so he was in implementing this principle that God is our father. And because he's our father, he also hears us. Well, what I want to put a focus on is how exactly that happened. Because you and I here, I mean, I don't know, is there anyone who is Jewish here? Or like by, by I mean, by culture, by ethnicity, is, it, is there a Jew here? No? Well, what I wanted to say is this, that if you are not Jewish, believe it or not, he was not your father. He became your father. And that is why I celebrate Father's Day to my father because I'm an adopted son. I was not, I, I would say, and I would even prove it to you scripturally, that we became his children. It wasn't that we were, we became his children. And that's why we should live a life of appreciation and gratefulness because I, I didn't belong here. I wasn't meant for this, but God meant for me to be here. I want us to open up Romans 11:17. So that we can get excited about what it truly means to have God as our Father. Because a lot of times, that is just something that we repeat while we pray. We just say, Father, you know, can you do this, Father? But we don't understand how or what's the importance of fatherhood, of his fatherhood. Okay? So once again, Romans eleven seventeen. 17. This is what the Apostle Paul says of the whole endeavor, of the whole thing. He says... But if some of the branches, this is a scary part, but if some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive were grafted in among them and became partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. Okay, let, let's get into this. First of all, the Bible describes the people of Israel as an, an olive shoot. It describes it as a tree. This is the nation of Israel. This is the people of God. Everyone who is the descendants of Abraham all became these descendants of a blessing. And so God originally had this tree... And this tree had branches of all the tribes of Israel. This tree represented all the Jewish people. And so the Bible says, or this is the Apostle Paul, then giving the prophetic picture of what happened. You and I weren't sons and daughters of God. You and I belong to what is called the wild olive tree. Y'all are wild. You're part of a wild olive tree. You're, you are out there. The Bible calls us Gentiles. But to the to Jewish people, we're, we're called Gentiles. We're not part of that tree. But the Bible says that what then God did out of his mercy and out of his grace because he saw you and he loved you. He foreknew that he wanted to save you. And so what he did was this, that in his perfect plan, he did something that no one would think he would do. He broke off some of the branches to make room for the wild olive branches. And Paul says, how dare we, we, we be arrogant? Because nowadays, the, the type of language some people use, I mean, I'm, a, I, I'm sorry, but sometimes I hear Christians like really talking bad about Jewish people. 
as if we have completely replaced them and eradicated them. And, and it's like, oh, yeah, we're, we're better because now we're in a better promise. We're better people. We're now Christians. We're now the real Israel, not them. Paul says, get rid of that theology. How dare you be arrogant? That branch was broken off so you can be grafted in. You should be thanking Israel, thanking them. But if you read on in Romans eleven seventeen, 17, because some of us might be saying, oh, but we replaced Israel. Hold up. Hold up. Because then after in the verses after, he says, but did you not know that God can regraft those branches that were broken off? That is a prophetic word that in the end times, there's a revival in Israel. Someone give an applause to Jesus. There's going to be a revival in Israel. And they're going to be regrafted in. That's a beautiful picture. But what does grafting mean? Because sometimes we read that word and we're like, hold up. What, what does that truly mean? What does it mean for God to graft us? Well, uh, the, the way that I can explain it is like this. So what essentially happens in agriculture, even back then in the days uh, of Roman, ancient Roman culture, where the apostle Paul grew up in, he understood that at times... In order for a branch to bear fruit or in order for an olive tree to be able to give fruit to a branch, what the, what the Romans would do is that they would first cut off a branch and then get a branch from a wild olive, let's say, and then they would literally come and wherever that branch was broken off, they would then stick it. And what they would do is that they would put a special paste around it to hold it in place, and not only that, but then they would mend it with like a, with a, a, a piece of cloth. Like just look, picture it as a cast. So they would put a cast around whatever was grafted in. Now this is important because you and I are grafted in to this olive tree. But in order for grafting to work, I mean, hold up, this is crazy. The fact that you can get two trees, put them together, and then they will coexist, and then that branch can bear fruit is a miracle in and of itself. And so what it's saying here is that we are now grafted into this olive tree, but in order for us to be grafted, what we need to do is that first of all, we need to be aligned. I was reading about this grafting process and, and part of it scientifically what literally happens is that literally the vein of the origin, the, the, the shoot of the root begins to align itself with the branch until the point that they're no longer two, but then they become one. And so that is a process of what it means to be a Christian. You and I aren't automatically just grafted the moment that uh, we do the altar call. We call you up and you do the confession of faith. And we think, oh, I'm grafted. I'm good. Hold up. Grafting is a process. You got to get aligned. You got to get aligned to the root. And then once you're aligned, then you become one. And then you bear good fruit. So I want to tell you that the mission of Christianity is not that we just are with our God, but we become one with him. Not just that we introduce Jesus into our life, but that we become one with Jesus. That is the process of grafting. So I, I want to give you more scripture of this grafting process and what our father does. So remember what we said. We were broken off of the wild olive tree out of the wildlife, and we're grafted into the tree of Jesus, of the blessings of God, of salvation. So let's go to John 15, verse 1. So once again, John 15, verse 1, and let's look at what it says. It says, I am the true vine. So he's describing, once again, I'm, the, I'm that vine that you're getting grafted into. I am the true vine. And who is Abba Father? And my father is? The vine dresser. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. That sounds scary. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. 
Here's the key. And later on, if you read, I mean, it's beautiful. I give you guys homework to read uh, uh, John chapter 15. In the rest of it, then it begins to proclaim different things. It says, what does it mean to be taken away? To be taken away from the branch means to go to a place that was never created for you. It's a place that if you already know, you know what I mean. It's the fire, the H-E double hockey sticks, hell, the place that we are afraid to talk about on pulpits because we might scare people. But I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ was not ashamed to say that truth. He said, if you are broken off of this branch, I'm sorry, I am the only way, the truth, and the life. No other religion can get you into this branch to bear fruit. It's only me. Get grafted in. Or go somewhere where, where it was never created for you. You weren't destined for that place. You were destined to be grafted in. And so to me it's concerning because I want to get grafted in. Because that's what my Abba Father wants to do with me. He wants to graft me in into the vine. And so uh, this is what Jesus says in the rest of the chapter of, of John 15. He, he then says, abide in me and I in you. Doesn't that not sound like the grafting process? It's that not only is it that Jesus needs to be with you or in you, you need to be in Jesus. And so he says, abide in me and I in you. See, when you became a Christian, it's not just about you uh, entering the kingdom. The kingdom now has to enter into you. And that grafting process is the beautiful process of me and Jesus becoming closer and closer and closer until we become one. Abide in me and I in you. It's a powerful statement. Uh, and, and I want to I uh, introduce this to you. So first of all, how is it that this grafting even works? Number one is that our father, he comes and brings us into the vine. But then there is another person which I love, and I've been talking about him in this season. I want to continue talking about him in this season. And it is the Holy Spirit. Say Holy Spirit with me. Okay. The Holy Spirit is needed to be grafted in. Let's look at Romans 8, 9. So you don't think I'm crazy. Okay. Romans 8, 9. Look at what it says. This is how you get grafted in. He says, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. What does the second half say? But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Because it's not just about me doing the altar call prayer. It's about me having the spirit of God in me. And this spirit, when he is in me, he makes me belong to Jesus. And when I belong with Jesus, he then begins to bear fruit in me. Here's the beautiful part. What is the biggest evidence that I am grafted in? Because this is not an important question. Not to cast doubt on anyone because I believe that all of us are walking in faith in Jesus. But have you asked yourself, how do I know if I'm saved? How do I know if I'm not one of those branches that, that tried to get grafted in but didn't get grafted in? How do I know? <laughs> well, the Bible says... That one of the greatest evidences that I'm grafted in is that I'm bearing fruit. That means the grafting worked. Does that make sense? Okay, that's the biggest evidence that I have that I am grafted in, that I'm bearing fruit. And what is this fruit? What type of fruit am I talking about? The type of fruit that Jesus is talking about is that my life is beginning to look like Jesus' life. And it doesn't, I don't mean that you're already perfect. I'm not saying that you're already sinless or, or that you'll never make a mistake ever again in your life. I'm not talking about that. But what I am saying is that once you're grafted in, there is at least something, some nutrients that are pumping into you that you say, I have this desire to be holy. I don't know why. I have this desire to come to church. Something's pulling me to listen to a preaching. Something is pulling me to, to need to respond to God, to pray to God. There's something in me that is telling me I need, to, I need to acknowledge him, that I need to read his word. That is the grafting process. That there is nutrients now coming from the original vine, now coming and being deposited into my life. Amen. Are we getting this so far? So I need to know... I, I, am I attached to the vine? Am I truly attached to the vine? Now, now look at this. So um, I, I remember learning this, that um, 
They, they, they were telling me in, 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 in one of the, the classes that I took, and, and they were mentioning that the process of which baptisms work or, or how they function is this. That originally when we accept Christ into our life, the one that does that baptism into the body of Christ is the Holy Spirit. But then there's a second baptism that happens. But the person you're baptized into changes. Okay, hold up. Picture it this way. That when we become Christians, when we accept Jesus as Lord as, as Savior, the Holy Spirit takes us and baptizes us into the body of Christ. So what is that? I mean, if you picture, you know, a baptismal, this baptismal is Jesus. And the Holy Spirit takes your life and baptizes you into Jesus. Here, you're baptized and you're now part of the body. But then what happens next? Now then Jesus comes to you and says, now I baptize you in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Isn't that good? See, it's, it's about we are getting baptized into, we are abiding in him and him and us. There is a connection, there is a oneness now between us and God. This is, a, this is a beautiful picture. This is the picture of marriage. That's why God, when he talks about his church, he calls us his bride. Because as we know, in marriage, when you are married, you become one. Amen? Okay. So, I want to put this focus today, the vine dresser, with the, the, the last few moments that I have with you today. I want to introduce to you the vine dresser. This is our Abba, Father. Jesus is the one that claims it. He says, I have a father and I am a vine, but this father I have is a vine dresser. And we got to be careful about this detail about him. Because if we want to bear fruit, we need to know that there is somebody that has an expectation for that fruit. A vine dresser does not graft without a purpose. When he grafts and does that work is because he has an expectation. This will have fruit. And so for all of you guys here today, that's God's expectation. But whoa, my dad, my God has an expectation of me. I understand it's by grace. We're all saved by grace, but no one grafts for no purpose. He grafted you because he believes you will bear fruit. Okay, so if you're here in Christianity, if you are saved, if you are a believer in Jesus, it's because God believes there is fruit in you that you will bear. Uh, and so what does this mean, this abiding in Christ? Well, number one is this. It means to get into God's word. It also means to trust Jesus. It means to trust him. It means to get into his love. And watch this. So the beautiful thing about being a branch is that the 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 nutrients to bear fruit does not come from me. It comes from the original tree. So if that's the case, my role is not to fight to bear fruit, but to have a relationship with Jesus. Your role is not that I need to fight until I bear fruit in my life. No, no. Have a relationship with Jesus. Surrender to that grafting Allow yourself to be grafted and it automatically happens. The fruit begins to be born out of your life. Something I love to say is this, that it's not fruits that produces intimacy with your God. It's intimacy with your God that produces fruits. And a lot of the time we say, man, I'm not close to God because I'm not, I don't have the fruits to, to be in relationship with him. That's, you got it backwards. Be in relationship with him without fruits. But when you're in intimacy with Abba Father, then the fruits begin to come out of your life. Amen. Jesus didn't say your responsibility is to bear fruit. He said your responsibility is abide in me and I in you. Okay. So the fruit does not come from us. We only bear it. He's the source that gives it. Plug into the source. Now, here's the part that I, I really want to put emphasis on. The part that is hard for us Christians to understand, but it's the best part. It is this. Because our Abba Father is a vine dresser, vine dressers also have another nature. And it is this, that they prune what is giving fruit. And that, and what does pruning mean? Well, let me explain to you what pruning means. Pruning is 
Oh, wow, I, I even have a demonstration here today. By the way, thank you so much for bringing this. Thank you um, for celebrating Father's Day. But God touched your heart because, I mean, I was going to talk about this. But what, is, what does pruning mean? Well, pruning means that, you see, I'm not going to cut these branches because they're not bearing fruit. I'm going to cut the branches that are bearing fruit. And that sounds strange. Because it's like, I thought you're going to cut off the ones that aren't bearing fruit. No, the ones that are bearing fruit are cut. Why? Because the vine dresser then expects better fruit. He expects more. I love it. See, see, it's just that the father is not just excited that you bear some fruit. He's excited when you bear much fruit. Because his expectation, his heart for you is not to remain at the same level. You know, it is dangerous for a branch to not be pruned. You want to know why? Because every time a tree is not pruned, it becomes harder and harder to bear the same fruit. <laughs> it becomes difficult. It takes longer. I was actually reading about this. It says that, I was reading that it takes longer for a fruit to ripen and get nutrients if it's not pruned. So notice this, that if we are not pruned, pruned if we never go through anything in life it'll become harder and harder for us to bear fruit for God why because a life that is never pruned never gets excited never gets a, a motive to continue going a life that is not pruned is a life that doesn't go through the experiences that are necessary for us to bear more fruit and and this is what important what's important so in this pruning process what the, what the vine dresser does is that he gets these big scissors, if you can imagine, and he begins to cut everything that was bearing fruit. And what is that? Well, let me tell you, pruning is not a punishment. Let me say that again. Pruning is not a punishment. It's not that God looks at your life and says, hey, you, you're not doing anything with your life, so let me punish you. No, it's that those who are doing good stuff for me, let me... Let me, let me prune them. Let me get them, let, let me have them go through some stuff to bear more fruit. And, and I, I want you to, to kind of see it this way. Job said it as an observation of life. Job said, God giveth and he taketh away. How many of you guys struggle with that statement? I know I do. At times I struggle with that statement. The Lord giveth. And the Lord taketh away, man. It could be that everything is going well in my life and then it's taken from me. Isn't that hard? That's a hard theology to swallow. That's a hard principle to understand. God, I'm serving you. I'm worshiping you. I, I, I'm going to church and I'm giving my life to you. And yet you're pruning me? You're taking stuff away from me. It's tough. It's not an easy thing. But God says, hold up. See, that scripture that says the Lord gives and takes away, let me tell you, God doesn't take away something from you to destroy you. He doesn't take something from you to punish you. If he takes it away, it's because you didn't need it in your life in this season. It's because he has something better set out for your life. I need to believe that when God takes something from my life, see, if the doors close at that job, if that contract just ceases, maybe I don't have the traction I used to have, or maybe I'm not having the same results that I used to have, God says, I'm just pruding you. Don't worry. I'm going to have better fruit come your way. But what's important for me is for you learning what this pruning process does. It doesn't look nice to be pruned. This is literally what a pruned tree looks like. It looks like a tree that isn't impressive. But when the season comes, suddenly the fruit comes. And that fruit is beautiful. The pruning looks ugly. Some of us look like we've been pruned right now. <laughs> we've been pruned. But you know what? Then afterwards, we're going to bear good fruit. <laughs> yeah, somebody say amen to that. You're going to bear good fruit. See, God acknowledges that you are bearing good fruit already. And let me tell you something. 
every time God prunes a church or a people is because big things are coming. I'm not talking about people leaving because I know our minds go there. It's like, oh God, are, are, you talk, are, you, are you talking, Pastor, about people leaving? No, I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is that when God begins to show a church that he is going through a pruning process in us, meaning we have some struggles, meaning we're going through some battles, meaning we have some attacks, maybe we're going through financial issues, maybe we're having family problems in our lives. Can I give you some good news? If you are feeling like there has been a pruning process in your life, get ready because good fruit is on its way. Good fruit is on its way. You want to know what else is a pruning process? See, if I can take this back into, so Abba Father shows us the nature of pruning. Our earthly father shall also prune. And what does that look like on an earthly father or a spiritual father? It is this. It is whenever a spiritual father gives you feedback, he is pruning you. Feedback does not mean you did a bad job. Feedback means I love that you bore good fruit. But let me help you to bear even more fruit. That's feedback. And so spiritual fathers, they give feedback. They have confrontation. Maybe they help us through a time of trial. But this is what pruning is. And it helps us to be better. Or would you rather live a life where all, all it is is just applauses? Like good job everyone. Always good job, good job, but no feedback. You'll always bear the same fruit. How many of you guys want feedback and confrontation? Yeah? Get, get ready. You're, you're about to receive a text from me. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, no, but in, in reality, no, it's good. It's good to have feedback, to have. I, I love that in my life because there are times when maybe all you hear is just compliments. Like, hey, great job. But then a spiritual father then comes to you and says, hold up. But we can do better. We can do even more. And that's some good stuff. We can always improve. Can I tell you something? The moment you think you no longer need to improve is the moment you stop growing. The moment I say, you know what, I don't need feedback. All right. Then bear the same fruit over and over again. It's going to be harder to bear that fruit too. But if you want to grow, get feedback. Get challenged. Get shaken up. All right. Okay, so um, I also want to say something. So today's preaching is also to clarify that God, when he loves his people or loves his church it's not punishment it's disciplining say the word discipline okay it's a word that some of us are like but how is God I mean how can a loving father discipline well I mean all scattered throughout scriptures there's constant disciplining but it's a good thing in fact the Bible says that he who spares the rod to his child what he does not love them so man if you've never been confronted in your life, it's because you're not loved by the people <laughs> that, that is over you, the authority over you. And let me tell you that if our, like my, my dad, in this, at this point in my life, I'm appreciative and very, uh, I have this heart of gratitude towards him because he has confronted me. And let me, and let me prove it to you, okay? Hebrews 12, 9. Hebrews 12, 9, because some of you are like, well, hold up. My father loves me and he's never going to discipline me. But let me explain what that means. All right. Hebrews 12, 9. It says, furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us. Who here got disciplined by your parents? I mean, yeah. Oh, man. You have the scars to prove it, don't you? <laughs> All right. And it says, and we respected them. How, how many of you perhaps now as a grown-up, you look back and say, you know what? I respect my dad for, you know, for confronting me those times, for, for helping me, disciplining me in those seasons of my life. He, so, so the Bible says this. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. And then it says, shall we not much rather be subject to the father of spirits and live? Now let's go to the, to the next verse. For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. But he, talking about God, but God disciplines us for our good so that we, we may share his holiness. Now, look at this. 
All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. This is talking about the grafting process. It's about being disciplined by God. And what does that word discipline mean? It's not that God wants to shame you in public. But in private, he wants to teach you a lesson. He wants to go in private and say, hey, see, because the nature of God is this, that he loves us all. All of us who are here in this place today, he loves you so much. And a lot of us, we come to church as we are, and we're not perfect. We're part of that wild olive tree, and we're, we're here to get grafted in. And, and, and we're not perfect in the eyes of God, but God says, I still love you. But because I love you, I don't want you to remain the same. Because I love you. And he makes, the Apostle Paul makes this comparison. Just like our earthly fathers, a good father, if he truly loves you, he will not allow you to do the same things over and over again, knowing that it hurts you. No, he's going to confront and say, stop doing that because it's going to harm you. And so in the same way, God, because he loves us, because he loves us, he will discipline. Now hold up. So does that mean that he's up there with a thunderbolt in heaven just ready for us to make a mistake and then phew, let me mess up with their life? That's not the heart of a good father. The heart of a good father is this, that we mess up, his Holy Spirit will come and say, hey, what you're doing is not right. We might even go through some consequences of our sin, but it's not God that sends the consequences to the sin. But it is our own sin that perhaps invites a consequence. But God says, you touched fire. I would be a bad father if I didn't let you know that it burns. So let me let it burn you. Not kill you, not destroy you, but let me let it burn you. So that now you will know, wow God, you have better things set out for me. That is a good father. And look at what it says here. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful. How many guys are excited about, you know, being disciplined? Of course not. We're not like, oh, yes, Lord. We never sing a song like, Lord, discipline me. Like, none of us are joyful about that aspect in our lives. But then, but we're sorrowful. But the Bible then says, but those who are trained in the discipline, in the pruning of God, then we bear the fruit of righteousness. And it is peaceful. It is glorious. So I, I, I wanted to share that with you. If you feel like there's cutbacks in your life, maybe you're going through a season of sickness. Maybe you're going through a season of, man, things are difficult for my life right now. Let me tell you that whenever there is growth, there's always something called growth pains. Can I tell you this? Um, well, first of all, my, my, my son Xavier um, in, in the past, uh, you know, every now and then, he will come to me and say, hey, dad, uh, my, my, my legs hurt. And so, you know, we, I, I remember going even to the, hos the, not hospital, the doctor, and we even got him checked and everything, and, and there was nothing wrong with him. I mean, the doctor's like, well, everything's fine. Even they checked how he walked. They went to, he went to a specialist, and they're, and they're like, everything is, is fine. And that's the thing. It was just here and then he would whisper, oh, my legs kind of hurt. But I began to read online that that is called growth pains. He's growing, yeah. And so essentially, every time he's growing, his body is feeling pain. Growing hurts. It hurts to grow. Let me tell you that even babies, as they are growing their teeth, what happens to them? Man, they get a fever, they're in pain, they cry, they need like that aura gel, whatever it's called, the numbing gel. And they need that because it's hurtful. It, it hurts. And let me tell you the same thing. Your growth will not be easy. It will be. There will be growth pains. But trust me, it's worth the fruit. <laughs> it's worth it. Because at the same time that I'm going through these pains, at the same time that I'm experiencing trials and going through a process, I'm being grafted in. And at the end of the day, well, Lord... I'm becoming more and more like you until I become one with Jesus. I want to just finish off with this. Um, in the Bible, we even see the oneness that people become like Jesus. We see in the Bible that in the time of crucifixion, when they were, uh, when, when were going to crucify Jesus, 
in that moment where Peter denies Jesus three times, what happens then? See, the reason why he had to deny three times is because he really, really sounded like Jesus. They confronted him. They, they, they called Peter and they said, hey, ho, hold up. You over there, you're a follower of Jesus. And Peter was like, no, that's not me. What do you mean? What are you talking about? But they were like, no, no, you, you are. You, you kind of look like a follower of Jesus. You kind of sound like a follower of Jesus. Are you sure? And Peter was trying so hard. He's like, oh, man, let me change my accent. I'm from another country. No. And, and he began to pretend that he wasn't. But they're like, no, 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 you got to be. Until he had to deny three times. Why? Because when you're grafted in, you look so much like Jesus. You may not even notice it until you go and visit your family again that you haven't seen in a while. They'll be like, whoa, you changed. Yeah, I look like Jesus now. I, I sound like him. I talk like him. I pray like him. That's the objective of the Holy Spirit, to get you grafted in. But that process of sounding, looking, praying, and thinking like Jesus is painful. It's going to be trials. It's going to be seasons of going through battles and struggles, but it is worth it. Because you will be like Christ. Amen. Challenge accepted. Yes. Amen. <laughs> awesome. So I'm just going to finish off with this. If I can get the piano guy to, to come and help me out today. Now we have two piano guys. I mean, <laughs> I, now I have to clarify which piano guy. <laughs> oh, man. Sometimes everything is going right until it's not, you know, and, and there is cutback, there's shortcomings, there's, it's just, it, it occurs like a cycle and God created life as a cycle. You know, even, even economies go through, you know, booms and busts like they say, you know, but it's a cycle. They actually say that recessions are healthy for an economy. Did you know that? It's healthy. Ah, I love it. After a recession, then comes an expansion. No one's laughing and joyful during a recession. But when the expansion comes, man, a whole generation of successful people are birthed. Someone catch that. <laughs> Even in the spiritual realm, when you feel like there's a spiritual recession, when you feel like there's a recession in the spiritual realm, like, man, it's been a while since I've seen a miracle. It's been a while since I've seen people be delivered. It's been a while since someone gave their life to Jesus. Whenever there's a spiritual recession or pruning, there's a lesson in that. See, because if everything went well for you, you and I have the temptation of our hearts becoming prideful. Oh yeah, that was me. Look at this fruit. That's, that, I did that. The fruit, the reason why there's fruit is because of me. But then God prunes because he wants you to stop serving your fruit and start serving the vine. Because we're so addicted to the fruit that we forget about the vine. But God says, hold on, let me prune you for a season. Let me humble you for a season. Whoa, how, do you, are, are you still going to love me when the hours are cut back? Are you still going to honor me when things aren't going so perfect? But like Job, go into a season that says, God, I say yes even through the pruning process. Because you're pruning me because you love me. And because you're my father, you're pruning me. And I give you thanks because I'm about to bear good fruit. For some of you guys, maybe this is a confirmation. For others of you, it's good news because you're like, man, good fruit is about to come. Good fruit is about to come. Let's all stand up on our feet and let's just close our eyes. First of all, for anyone who is here today who has any doubts whether they are grafted in, I did not say those words. You can be offended with me, that's okay, but Jesus said those words where he said, 
any branch that is not connected to the vine is thrown into the fire. It's scary, but it wasn't created for you. It's not meant for you. But today I wish, I hope, I pray that you get grafted in because there's only, there's salvation, there is joy when we're grafted in. So if you feel like you're not really sure, confident that you've been grafted in, right where you are, with everyone's eyes closed, I, I just want you to lift up your hands and I'm just going to make this prayer over your life. But this prayer is just an initiation. See, the altar calls that we do for salvation prayers doesn't mean, it, it doesn't, it's not the magic words for salvation. It's the initiation for a lifestyle of being grafted into the vine. So let's get initiated today. Let's get grafted in today. So if that is you, if you've never been grafted before, or if you're unsure whether the grafting process has occurred, right where you are, with everyone's eyes closed, lift up your hands, and I'll just make this prayer for you. Lift up your hands where you are. Let's get you grafted in. Let's get you grafted in. I see, I see a couple of hands. Glory to God. In this moment, let's just make that prayer for all of those. And for those who are grafted in, even, even you, I pray that you join in into this prayer. Just repeat after me. Just say, Father, today I know that you're a vine dresser. And you want to graft me in. Today, I accept the grafting process. I want to be connected to the true vine, to salvation. Today, I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Holy Spirit, indwell my heart so that I can become one with Jesus. Amen and amen. Hi everyone, thank you so much for listening to one of our sermons here at Atmosphere Church. If you're ever in the area, we would love to have you come over and join us in one of our worship experiences. Also, just a friendly reminder to like, share, and subscribe to our Atmosphere Church YouTube channel. That way you never miss out on one of our live streams or one of our latest sermons. We love you so much and we can't wait to connect with you again.